Good morning. It is so great to be with you again today. Well, today we have a breakthrough. We spent probably a couple of months on Galatians chapter 4. We're going to start Galatians chapter 5 today. And if you recall last week when we wrapped up Galatians chapter 4, the end of Galatians chapter 4, we're talking about two covenants, a covenant of bondage and a covenant of freedom. And Galatians chapter 4 says at the end that the children of the born woman will not inherit it with the children of the free. And the born woman refers to the children of Hagar. That was the child of the flesh. If you recall the story, God had given Abraham a promise when Abraham was 75 years old and, and Sarah was 65 that you find in Genesis chapter 15 that they would have a son. And 12 years later, Sarah gets a bright idea. Let's help God out. And so Abraham has a child through Sarah's maid, and that son was called Ishmael. And it was not until 12 years later that God appeared to Abram when Abram was 99 years old and Sarah was 89. And he says, by this time next year, Sarah, your wife, shall have a child. And my covenant will be established through him. So the child of the flesh was Ishmael. The child of the promise was Isaac. So Galatians chapter 4 finishes by saying, the child of the born woman, the child of the flesh, will not inherit along with the child of the promise. So now Galatians chapter 1 begins. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1, begin by God saying, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free, and do not entangle yourselves again with the yoke of bondage. Now, let's look at this scripture in context. If you recall, six months ago when we started our study in Galatians, that the whole purpose of the book of Galatians was to rebuke the people that were called the Judaizers. The province of Galatia was a, a province in, in the Roman Empire where Paul did a lot of evangelism. And so there are a lot of converts now in Galatia. And so the Jews that had received Christ in Jerusalem come over to Galatia. To tell these new Christians, you have to be circumcised and you got to keep the law. And this is the context of the book of Galatians. If you recall in Galatians chapter 1, Paul says very clearly, If anyone preaches any other gospel than the gospel of grace that I have preached unto you, let him or her be accursed. And the gospel of grace is salvation is purely by grace without any of the works of the law. If you add works to your faith, it is another gospel. And Paul says, let him be a curse. And as I have said so many times before, the biggest enemy of Christianity is religion. It's not the devil, it is religion. Religion is man trying to reach God. This is what the law was all about. This is what the Ten Commandments and the other 603 laws that the Jews put forth. Total 613 laws. It's all about do's and don'ts, about trying to be acceptable unto God. And the Bible is quite clear that no one, no one can keep the law. 
And the law is quite clear to the Apostle Paul is crystal clear that no one can come to Christ through the works of the law. No one can come to Christ by following the Ten Commandments because no one can keep the Ten Commandments. Jesus made it very clear when he said, if you look at a person with lust, you've already committed adultery. If you have hatred in your heart, you've already committed murder. So the law was not given as a way to God. Please get this. The Ten Commandments were not given as a way to achieve heaven. Now, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are perfect. And they are a, a moral code. But they are not a way to achieve acceptance by God. And the easiest way to understand that is this. If you could achieve acceptance by God by keeping the Ten Commandments, then Jesus wouldn't have had to come. Then the cross would have been the biggest crime of all history. The reality is no one could keep it. And the whole purpose, according to the Apostle Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, the law was given, the Ten Commandments was given to show people their need for a Savior. If you read through the whole book of Leviticus about all the sacrifices in the book of Leviticus were only a temporary covering for sin. And they were all had one purpose. The need for one day the Lamb of God will come and take away the sins of the world. So Paul now says, stand firm now. In the liberty that Christ has given you. Christ has set you free from bondage to works. Christ has set you free from bondage to the law. Christ has set you free from trying to do good in order to achieve heaven. You can't do it. Nothing wrong with doing good, but that's not the way to heaven. The way to heaven is only through the cross. We must get to the conclusion that it is an impossibility for any of us to be good enough to deserve heaven. And it is only through the sacrifice of Jesus that we have access to the Father. So he said, stand fast, therefore, in that liberty. Christ has set you free from condemnation. Christ has set you free from the bondage of trying to be good enough. And so he says, don't try to justify yourself. You can't. It is impossible for you to justify yourself. Realize 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, which I have quoted so many times. For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. So at the cross, there was an exchange. Jesus he became who we were, that we may become who he is. Jesus put on our filthy rags, that we may put on his robe of righteousness. And hear me well. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, God sees you as righteous as Jesus. And perhaps your self-righteousness is now rising up. Oh, no, 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 no. There's no way I could be as righteous as Jesus. It's not your righteousness anyway. It's his righteousness that he has put on you. And let me tell you why it is imperative that you understand this. It is impossible for the holy to have communion with the mundane. It is impossible for the perfect to have communion with the imperfect. The only way we could have communion with God is if God sees us as perfect as he is. Otherwise, we could never have communion 
with him. Now, as humans, that is an impossibility. But God, through the new birth, has given us a new creation in the image of likeness of God, as righteous as God, and we are a new creation in the spirit. We are a new spiritual being. The Apostle Peter says that we have been translated from one kingdom to another kingdom. Here on earth. And so because Christ is in us. Remember when you came to Christ. Your sin nature died. Put away that false doctrine that you have two, two natures, a godly nature and a sin nature, and they're always worried. That's not biblical. We spend a month on Romans chapter 6, maybe more. And the reality is your old sin nature died the moment you came to Christ. And God put a new nature on you as righteous as Jesus. And so, in the spirit, your new spiritual being is as righteous as Jesus. And as we've said many times before, this is what's why Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, we've also talked at great extent where if we are as righteous as Jesus, if we are as perfect as Jesus, why do we still sin? And I don't have time to go back to it, but we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, that says that we are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit was all that was recreated. In the spirit, you and I are as perfect as Jesus. But we have a soul, which is composed of mind, will, and emotions, and that soul is not redeemed. That mind is filled with all kinds of bad programming, which are all our life experiences. And our emotions are extremely fickle, and our emotions will take us in all kinds of wrong paths. And the will is controlled by the mind. So the only way that we can, in the flesh, walk in according to the word of God, is we need to renew our minds. We need to change the bad programming with good programming. And this is why Romans 12, 2 says that we are to renew our minds by the daily washing of the water by the word of God. We renew our minds with the word of God so that our programming can be changed from those bad experiences to the word of God. And the more of the word of God you put into your mind, the more that you will be able to walk in the spirit. Paul says, and we'll get to it in a little bit, walk in the spirit and you will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. So the flesh, and remember the flesh is not your old sin nature. This is where many people misunderstand Romans chapter 7. The flesh is not your sin nature. Your sin nature is dead. The flesh is the soul, your mind, will, and emotions. And this is why if you really study Romans chapter 7, Paul says, it is no longer I that sin. Why? Because I'm a new creation in the image of God. It's not only I that sin. I, my new creation, cannot sin but sin that dwell in my members. And what Paul calls the members is the soul, mind, will, and emotions. So anyway, he says, be free from the bondage of the law. This is what Paul is saying in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Be free because keeping commandments, keeping the law, trying to do good to earn favor with God keeps you in total bondage. And so you need to realize Jesus at the cross said, it is finished. He did it all. Salvation, healing, and deliverance was all provided for you at the cross. And we need to realize, 
And I've said it many times, the biggest problem we have as Christians is we forget our identity. We forget who we are. And of course, the devil works double time to tell you you're nobody. And you need to tell the devil back, you know, I may not be a nobody, but there's somebody in me. Yes. And he is the king of kings and lord of lords, and I walk in him. That's why there is no condemnation. So Paul is saying, be free from the bondage of trying to earn favor with God. He did it all. He did it all. You know, I've talked before about Hebrews chapter 4. And one of these days we're going to get to the book of Hebrews. Who knows when that will be. <laughs> but Hebrews chapter 4 talks about entering into God's rest. We need to realize that God did it all. And the book of Hebrews chapter 4 says, As God rested from his own works on the seventh day, even so, you rest from your own works. It's about time that we realize it's not by doing, it is by being. Yes. When we understand who we are in Christ, there will be no condemnation. There will be no way that the devil could condemn you. Because it's not what you do, it's who you are. And as you, the more you understand that, the more you can get out of the way and let Christ in you, the hope of glory, be manifested in and through you. Okay. And there are those that, you know, are trying religion. Religion is just put people in so in bondage. And James says, if you keep the whole law and you fail in one point, you're guilty of all. So doing ain't going to get you there. Doing is only going to get you to the end of yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get to the end of yourself and realize it's all by grace, you're going to live under constant self-condemnation. That is not the abundant life that Jesus talked about. We need to realize our righteousness is all not in ourselves all. Oh. Sorry about that. Turn, turn it off. It's not in ourselves, but it is, it is in him. And so we, we receive our righteousness from him. And so when you do that, obviously condemnation cannot get a hold of you. Because you're not resting on what you do, but on what he has done. And, you know... Let's look at this verse in its full context. I'm going to quote it again. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free, and do not entangle yourselves again in the yoke of bondage. So first of all, it was about the Judaizers. Secondly, it's about our being free from sin and walking in the fullness of God. But we also can apply it to the political situation. We can also apply it to the civic society. We have to realize that if we do not understand that God is in control, we can allow ourselves to be in bondage to the unrighteousness that we see around us. And so we need to understand that that also gives us a responsibility. If we are children of the king, that means we need to represent the king in every area of our lives. And that includes the civic society. That means that we need to be involved in the civic process. You know, we are so blessed in America. We live in the greatest country on the face of the earth. Do you realize that the majority of the people of the earth live under either a dictatorship or a monarchy? Even today, the great majority of the people of the, of the world are living like bond servants, like slaves to a, 
a tyrant. But America is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. I tell you, the framers of this country were strong, committed Christian people who were on their knees while our declaration was written and while our constitution was written. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that the Constitution of the United States of America is a divinely inspired document. You know why? Because those framers were on their knees seeking revelation from God. And revelation is what they got. The average lifespan of a constitution around the world is only 17 years. And yet, in September of this year, we will celebrate 235 years of our constitution. It's lasted over 20 times more than any other constitution in the world. Why? Because it was forged on the knees of the framers. And so if you look at the very first three words on the constitution, what does it say? We, the people. That means that we, the people, are the rulers of this nation. You see, we've been deceived into thinking that we work for those politicians when the Constitution says they work for us. And as a matter of fact, we have the power to hire them and to fire them. How do we do that? Through our vote. That means if you don't vote, you become part of the problem. But voting is not enough. You need to make sure that you vote for men and women that are going to uphold the Judeo-Christian principles upon which this nation was built. Proverbs 29 and 2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked bear its rule, people mourn. But, if the righteous are not running for office, and I'm not talking about self-righteousness. I'm talking about those that have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If the righteous are not running for office, if the righteous are not even voting, then what's left? The wicked electing the wicked, and it becomes our fault. As Christians, we have a civic responsibility before God to vote in every election and vote for men and women that are going to uphold the principles of this book, the principles upon which America was built. And do not believe for a minute that America was a secular country. America was built by committed Christian people. America was built as a Christian nation. And so it is that reason why we've been so blessed in this country. Because Jesus Christ has been at the helm of this country for a long time. Now, it is sad to see the deterioration of our moral values that we have seen over the, the last two, three decades. And it has gone at an accelerated pace in the last few years. It is why. It is because the church has failed to be salt and light. And way too much of the church has become just tickling men's and women's ears. While the country is going to hell in a handbasket, that is not biblical. And it you must realize to whom much is given, much is required. We have been given the greatest country on the face of the earth. And we have a stewardship responsibility over this country. And we exercise that stewardship responsibility by voting for righteous leaders. Now, I encourage you that are listening to me, run for public office. I was just so excited talking to someone at, at this table that, that just got elected to city council. Somebody else that got elected to school board. I'll tell you what, we need men and women of God 
to decide I will become part of the solution and stop just complaining about the problem. Amen. It is up to us. It is up to us. Now, let me say this, and I know I will probably get some, some flack for this. The biggest cop out that I've ever, ever heard. God is in control. And people use that statement to excuse sitting on their rear end watching the idiot box while the country is going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> that is not biblical. God has given us a stewardship responsibility, even as far back as, as the garden. The very first thing God told Adam is you take care of the garden. You keep it and tend to it. That's a stewardship responsibility. We've been given the greatest country on the face of the earth. And we have a stewardship responsibility over this country. We cannot acquiesce. We cannot just say, God is in control. Or I'll just pray. Oh, yes, we must pray. We have to start with 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, that's you and I, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God said, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Yes, we must start with prayer. But after the amen, it's time to get off our knees and put feet to our prayers. We are God's hands. We are God's feet. We are God's mouthpiece. And as Jesus said, shout it from the housetops. We cannot be silent. You know, I was uh, preaching at a church yesterday and I quoted a man that I want to quote today. His name was Alexis de Tocqueville. Alexis de Tocqueville came to America from France right after the American Revolution. And he said, first he said, not until I went into the churches of America and saw its pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of its genius and power. Well, let me ask you a question. Are America's pulpits flame with righteousness? Some are, but it is a small minority. The majority of pastors are more concerned with tickling men's and women's ears than with preaching the whole counsel of God. They're more concerned with not offending anyone than with preaching the truth of the word of God. Praise God for those pastors that are standing firm on the word of God and preaching the whole counsel of God. So, and then he said, going back to Alexis de Tocqueville, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. The goodness of America is under attack. I mean, we see it today when uh, they tell you there are 76 sexes. You know, my sister was talking to a friend of hers who this other lady's daughter had a child in California. And so my sister asked this lady, well, uh, do you have a grandson or a granddaughter? And this lady said, well, I don't know because I called my daughter and I said, is it a boy or a girl? And you know what the, the woman answered? Well, we're going to let the child decide. <laughs> So she doesn't know if she has a grandson or a granddaughter because they're going to let the boy decide. This is It is child abuse. Yes. Thank you for saying that. It is child abuse. It is craziness. It has gone beyond even rational processes. When I'll tell you, and thank you for being on the school board, because I'll tell you what, let me tell you, when school boards are saying that teachers should have the right to help a child in transitioning to another sex without even telling the parents. 
This is child abuse. This is child mutilation. And it's becoming the law in way too many places across America. This is an abomination before God. And we are seeing the age of lawlessness. Mm -hmm. And it is getting worse and worse and worse every day. And, and I, this is going to sound heavy. If you're a Christian, we are the only ones that have the light. Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But you know, very interesting. He also said, you are the light of the world. So let me step on some toes. What are you doing with your light? What are you doing with your light? Are you shining it on darkness? Or are you hiding it under your pew? Or under the table? While you sit in your living room watching the idiot box. No, 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 no. It's time that we get involved. It's time that we become salt, salt to an insipid world. It is time that we become light to a world that is in darkness. You see, we need to realize that as Christians, we have a responsibility before God. The Bible says that we will have to render unto God a, an explanation for every idle word that has come out of our mouth. Amen. I believe the opposite is also true. We're going to have to render an account to God of the words that should have come out of our mouth, but we were too chicken to utter them. Yeah. We have a responsibility to be salt and light. I'll tell you, I believe that America's greatest days are still ahead. But it's going to take you and I to stand in the gap, not only in prayer, but in becoming involved. There are even people around this table, and certainly people watching me, that could be running for public office. And you could present an option for someone to be able to vote for somebody that's going to do the right thing. I encourage pastors all the time, people of faith, people of principle, run for public office. And it is a responsibility to each and every one of us to be voting for those men and women that are going to uphold the principles that have made America such a great country. You know, you have been given a new nature. You are Christ's representatives here on earth. Let's act in accordance to who we are. And, you know, let's go one more time to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You know, at the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. He did it all. Salvation, healing, and deliverance was all provided for you at the cross. So my question is, is, what are you in bondage to? If you're in bondage to sin, Jesus already paid for your sin. Come to him. Repent. And like this friend said to me yesterday, repent just means change your mind. Turn the other way. And receive the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. Well, you know something? Jesus did much more than forgive your sins. Jesus took upon his own body all of your infirmities, all of your sicknesses, all of your diseases. Jesus literally carried upon his own body every frustration, every heartache, every condemnation, every distress, every sickness, every disease every impairment, and the word of God says, and by his stripes you were healed. Jesus already did it. He already did it. So if you are on the condemnation, receive, receive the deliverance there is in Christ. Christ does not condemn you. Christ 
accepts you with open arm, why should you condemn yourself? If you feel that there is no way out, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Just follow him. If you have sickness in your body, Jesus already paid for it. You know, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, it says, And when it was dark, they brought to Jesus many that were demon-possessed. And with his word, Jesus cut out the demons, and he healed all, how many? Oh. All that were sick. That me may be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying himself took our sicknesses and bore our diseases. Jesus already paid for your sickness. Just receive it and say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God, that I am healed. Thank you that you paid for my healing. And all you need to pray for is for the manifestation in the physical of what is already a reality in the spiritual. It's already done. The healing is already done. All you're praying is not for God to heal you. God has already healed you. All you need to pray is there for the manifestation of what is already a spiritual reality to be manifested in your physical body. Now, do not get yourself into condemnation. I'm not saying that doctors are evil. God, doctors are instruments of God. And God can use a doctor to help you in your healing, but the healing comes from God. The doctors are instruments that in many times are used by God. But all healing comes from God. And he gets all the glory. And God wants you to give him all the glory. Receive his fullness. Walk in his fullness. He wants you to be totally one with him. He wants his fullness to be manifested in and through you. And so do not be under condemnation. He has already done it. And all you're praying is God manifest in my body what is already a reality in the spiritual. And you know, sometimes the process is instantaneous. Sometimes it is a process. You know, I was reading to someone a passage in Mark chapter 11 where God, Jesus cursed a fig tree. And when he did that, Nothing. There was no difference in the fig tree. But the next day, the tree was, was dead. And Jesus said that it had died from the roots. You can't see the roots. So believe that the healing has already started. Maybe you can't see it. Believe it's already done. And in time... That what started in the roots will be manifested in the physical. So just believe. God wants you to believe. You see, the world, and I've said this before too, the world tells you you have to see it to believe it. God says you have to believe it to see it. Amen. Believe that it is done. And just wait for that manifestation. And if you don't receive right now, just believe. It started in the roots. It's already done. I'm just waiting for the manifestation for it to come in the physical. And you can just say hallelujah in the midst of the sickness, knowing that it's already done and it's coming up from the roots. To God be all the glory. To God be all the glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Well, let's go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 2. Let's look at verses 2 and 3. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. I, I testify again to every man to become circumcised that he is a debtor or he's obligated to keep the whole law. Again, this goes back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And remember that the Judaizers were telling these Christians in Galatia, 
you must be circumcised and you must keep the law. Now, these Galatians are Gentiles. They are not Jews. So circumcision was a Jewish ritual when Abraham entered into covenant with God. It was something that it was a covenant with the Jewish people. Now, these Judaizers, these Jews in Jerusalem who had become Christians are now come to Galatia and are telling the Galatians Christians, you must be circumcised and you must also keep all the law. And that's talking about the Ten Commandments plus the other 603 commandments. In other words, be in bondage to doing. And remember that Paul condemned that. He said, if you add anything to the gospel of grace, it is another law. It's another gospel. It's not by doing, it's by being. So Paul is talking against the Judaizers. And, and so you got to realize that churches will try to put you on the condemnation. I mean, I have come to many churches where pastors say, oh, I could never preach pure grace because that's a license to sin. That's idiocy. When you realize that everything God has done is purely by grace, you will fall so much in love with Jesus and his presence will be so manifested in and through you that you will naturally will want to do what is right. Not out of obligation, but out of a manifestation of your new creation. Out of a manifestation of who you are. But you see, again, it is a lot of it is all about control. If a church can keep you in bondage to doing, they feel that they are controlling you it's not about doing it is about being and allowing him to work in and through you in a few weeks we will get to the fruit of the spirit and we will spend a month or two months on the fruit of the spirit and then we will see how God manifests himself in and through you and I'm excited because it is such a glorious study. And we're going to delve into it very, very deeply. And I know that people are going to be changed. I was changed. And I think you will too. And uh, then in five, verse 4, it says, You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. And uh, again, he's saying, you know, if you try to earn justification by your own works, you, you've given up on the gospel of grace. And I need to explain this phrase that is used here. You have fallen from grace. Because this statement has been so misused and has been used even by preachers to put people on the condemnation. And there are those churches that preach that you can lose your salvation and that's what they teach by falling from grace. But the reality is Jesus died once and for all. His sacrifice was complete. And as a matter of fact, the way the Apostle Peter puts it, there's no no the conclusion. You've been translated from one kingdom to another kingdom. Amen. The devil has no longer any power over you. Amen. You remember when we studied Romans chapter 6? There were two verses that I focused primarily on Romans chapter 6. One is verse 11, Romans 6, 11, that says, Reckon yourself. To be dead unto sin, but alive unto God, or to Jesus Christ your Lord. That word reckon in the Greek is a word logizomai. And logizomai means counted as a fact that you are dead. Counted as a fact that who you were 
died the moment you surrender your life to Christ. And then go up to verse 7. For he that is dead is free from sin. And that means he's free from the power of sin. So now the devil comes to tempt you. And you say, devil, you can't tempt me. I'm dead. And if I'm dead, you ain't got no power over me. So we need to realize that this concept of falling from grace has nothing to do with what some preachers have said. You can fall away and become unsaved. No, 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 no. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And they know me and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. Not temporary life, eternal life. My father who gave them to me is greater than to all. No one can take him out of my father's hands. If you are in Christ, you are secure forever. The book of Ephesians puts it this way. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That word sealed in the Greek is the word sfradizo. And it means a seal of protection. And it also means a seal of ownership. God says you belong to me. No one can take you out of my hands. So this concept of falling for grace has nothing to do with your losing your salvation. It means you have taken from your eyes, from your mind, that it was all by grace without the works of the law. It goes back to the first four chapters. Nothing to do with the works of the law. It's all by grace without the works of the law. Purely by grace. Purely by grace. I am so pleased. That it was nothing that I had to do in order to earn my relationship with Christ. Because there was nothing any of us could do to earn the right to be children of God. It is impossible. It is all by what he did. And all we have to do is receive it. You see, we just need to receive what he has already done. He did it all. He did it all. And that's how much he loves you and I. I mentioned it before. If you had been the only person on this earth, Jesus would still have come and died for you. That's how much he loves you. But it is all by his doing. And it's, if it's all by his doing, if you had nothing to do, but just receive what he has already done, there's no way you could lose what he has given you. He has put his spirit. God himself Amen. has come to live within you. And what did Jesus says? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. How long is never? Never. I will never forsake you. So get away from this thing that you can do something to lose your salvation. If you are in Christ, you're already walking in eternal life. Did you know that? That we are not waiting in eternal life. If you're a Christian, you're already walking in eternal life. You're already living in eternal life. And the more that you understand the word of God, and the more that you immerse in the word of God, the more you can reach heaven and bring heaven to earth and see the manifestation of the promises of God become reality in your life. This is really what prayer is all about. Amen. You know, I, I, I told you, I don't really pray. I don't really petition. I declare. I declare what the word of God says because this is the truth of the word of God. And all I'm doing is calling the things that are already in heaven, I'm calling them to be manifested on earth. That's what real prayer is. Amen. So you need to pray the word of God. Learn to pray the word of God back to God. And, you know, it is written. 
And if it is written, it is so. This is why you need to eat this word. This is why you need to memorize this word. You need to get it into your heart. Because once you do that, God will bring it to your remembrance. Amen. And you will be able to call that word and declare it. That's how you get rid of the devil. How did Jesus confront the devil when he was in the wilderness? What did he say three times? It is written. It is written. But if you don't know what is written, you're in trouble. You want to be able to call heaven upon this earth? You need to. You want to be able to declare the scriptures? You need to know the scriptures. This is why you need to be in this word daily. This is your daily bread. As you have bacon and eggs in the morning, have some bread. <laughs> have some spiritual bread. And I'll tell you what, there's no better way to start your day than eating the bread of the word of God. Amen. And when you do that, you will see him come alive in you. Yes. See, he wants to be manifested in and through you on a daily basis. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He wants you to walk in such a way that his presence so exudes from your countenance that others will come and grab you and say, what is it that you have? I don't know what it is, but I need it. We ought to walk so circumspectly that others will see Christ in you. Amen. You know, I've said it before. I can sit in this room and I can look at faces where I see the glory of God. And I know that it is because these people have been with Jesus today. And it manifests in their countenance. And others will see it. And you become a living testimony even without saying a word. Yes. You become a silent witness. And God will open divine opportunities for you to touch people all around you. Yes. You'll be surprised how simple and how glorious it is when you go to a restaurant and a waiter or a waitress comes to bring you a check and you say to that waitress, can I pray for you? And that young girl begins to weep. And it was exactly what that young lady or that young, young man needed. And God, all you had to do was be willing and available. And allow God to manifest himself in and through you. See, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that we are ambassadors for Christ. That means that if you are a Christian, you are God's representative on this earth. Are you a closet Christian? That, I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. As a matter of fact, hermits are not in the Bible. There was one, one guy that tried to be a hermit for a little while. His name was Elijah. And God found him in a cave and said, basically, get out of that cave. What are you doing in there? No, 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 no. God lives on, on this earth yes. after we come to Christ so we can be his witnesses. Mm -hmm. So we can be salt and light. So others can see Christ in us. God has blessed you for one purpose. For you to become a channel of blessings. You to become a channel of blessing. And each and every one of us can do that. And you will say. Well, well, well you know. I, I just don't know what to do. It's not about knowing. Except knowing him. And being surrendered to him. And say. Lord. What do you want to do. In my life today. Hear my Lord. Use me. Hear my Lord, send me. And you'd be surprised how even in the grocery store you run across somebody. 
that needs a pat in the back or needs a handheld or needs a prayer or needs a smile or needs a word of encouragement. God wants to use you and I. I encourage you. Be willing and available and allow him to be manifested in and through you. And the more you do that, the more you will experience his joy, his joy unspeakable. You know, one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible is Psalm 1611. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. Delights forevermore at his right hand. But we start the day by being in his presence. That's the way to start the day. Start the day in worship. Worship him because he's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Study Psalms 100. Just pray Psalms 100. Sing Psalms 100. There is a song about Psalms 100. And just rejoice in his presence. And as you begin your day immersed in his presence, guess what? His presence will be manifested in and through you as you go to your day. And just ask God with expectation, Lord, what do you want to do through me today? Mm -hmm. And just be available to him. And he will use you yes, he to will. his glory. And that joy will become more and more and more real in your life. Let us pray. Father, Lord God, we exalt you. We bless you, Father. We glorify your name. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace, for your goodness, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord God, that is not by the works of the law that we are justified, but it is by what you have done. It is by grace alone, Father. And we thank you, Lord God, that it's not because we deserved it, because your word says in this is demonstrated the love of God to where towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, not because we deserved it, but in spite of the fact that we didn't deserve it. Father, Lord God, we come before you today saying like the prophet Isaiah, hear my Lord, send me. Hear my Lord, use me. Father, may you use us to be salt and light to those who are in darkness. Father, we commit ourselves to you anew today, Father. Use us to your glory, Father. And we give you all the honor and all the praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.